Praise God. So how y'all doing tonight? Good. It's awesome to be here. I mean, I, I, I've heard so much about these classes, and this has been my first time coming, and uh, what a blessing. Just, just awesome. I'm, I'm thrilled, and I want you to know what a privilege I consider it uh, to be spending uh, this evening with you and coming to this class. It really has been a privilege to me. I'm glad that I know so many of you personally or have had you in a class before, and so I'm thankful for that. <clears throat> the teaching thus far has been stellar, really uplifting, really uh, personally building for me, uh, real confirming. In fact, let me ask, has, has that been, in my experience has been with sitting with my wife and we'd be going, yeah, yeah, yeah amen, you know, that's right, you know? And it's just like the Lord taking, uh, I don't know, these fibers and putting them together, you know, weaving something beautiful. And so uh, and this is a special group. And one of the reasons why I know this is a special group is because I know a lot of you not only are just hearers of the word, but you take the word and you run with it. Amen. And uh, there's nothing more pleasing to the Lord than for you not just to be ingesting information, but actually turning it and using it for the glory of Christ. <clears throat> so may the Lord continue to bless you and every step of faith that you take. Now I know that Frank and uh, <clears throat> John and uh, Bill, I know that you guys together are really great teachers and you have a lot of, a lot of other really great teachers to pull from. Unfortunately, none of them were available for tonight. <laughs> so you're stuck with me. But uh, <laughs> tonight I want to begin an introduction. And my introduction just kept growing. So this is, you're going to get to taste the mushroom I've been tasting the last few days. It just keeps growing. But I'm hopeful, and my, I, my plan, <laughs> hopefully it's the Lord's plan, is I'm going to want to encapsulate some of the things, actually many of the things that we have already touched on, but I want to bring it from a different kind of a mindset and a different kind of perspective. And the mindset that I want to bring it from is to bring it in such a way as we can now see these truths and how they are to unfold then in our daily lives. In other words, I've got these hot potatoes of truth, and what do I do with them? My assignment is called the goal, the goal of sanctification. But let me do this first and foremost. Let me back up a few steps. Let me take a running start at the whole idea of sanctification. I love the doctrine of sanctification. The Bible is very clear. We need sound doctrine. But tonight what I want to do is take the doctrine and make it into shoe leather, if you will, that we can then run on in our daily lives. We can use it for our own good and to bring glory to God. So let me be elementary then for a moment as we begin, based on the teachings that we've already had, you know that when I say the word sanctification, that what I'm speaking about is the progress towards holiness. That we're talking about spiritual growth and maturity, becoming increasingly separated from sin and separated unto Christ Jesus. You know, more of him, less of me, living more Christ-like in every way. Let me uh, take another quick poll here. Uh, how many here like Oreo cookies? Oh gosh, there's a lot of you that like Oreo cookies. Okay, now those of you that like Oreo cookies, how many of you are those that, you you tw you actually are those that twist it in, you look it. Yeah. How many more? Yeah. You twist it in, you eat the middle first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna be praying for you folks. <laughs> uh, write down their names, George. And, uh, but okay, here's, you ready? Salvation goes like this. The one side of the Oreo cookie is salvation. You get saved. Glorification is the other side of the cookie. When, when you're glorified as you stand before Christ. 
So where does that put us? That puts us right now in that creamy middle. <laughs> so sanctification is that creamy middle. <laughs> it's like a meanwhile back in the wrench. Does that fit or does it fit? Okay, there we go. <laughs> sanctification begins at our salvation. It ends at, or perhaps better put, it culminates at our glorification. We're justified, declared righteous at our salvation. We are glorified, made fully righteous when we see Jesus face to face. In the meantime, the space in the middle, we are progressively sanctified. You know, if the whole thing was just uh, being justified, then it would seem like the Lord would save us and take us home right away. Maybe we should be saying as Christians, I got saved, but why am I still here? I'm ready to go. I, I'd love to go. Why am I still here? It's because God's not done with you. How many times have you heard that? God's not done with you. You know, you know how I know God's not done with you? You're still breathing. <laughs> You're still here. God's plan's not done. There's something else God's going to do. That, so we're progressively being separated from sin under the holiness of Christ. The process then of sanctification goes on our entire life long. From this breath to our very last breath. We never finish <laughs> sanctification. We never cross a goal line in sanctification. And you'll see why in just a minute. Now, uh, everything that grows has to eat something. <laughs> That's how we grow, is by eating. Yeah, I like to eat. You can probably tell. <laughs> That's how I grow. <laughs> how we grow spiritually is also by eating. Eating the Word of God. So, how important then is it for somebody who's in the gooey middle... To be eating the word of God. You can't grow. You will not grow. Unless you are consuming the word of God. Let me give you something interesting. A little, little sideline here. A little rabbit trail if you will. Uh, between uh, 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 the, the flesh and the spirit. Have you ever noticed. How in order for your spirit to grow. You have to consume vast quantities of the Word of God. And it has to be coming at you very clear, very truthful, and you need to be paying attention. Has everybody ever noticed that? If I want to grow spiritually, I really need to have the Word of God, and I need it preached clearly, exactly the way it is. Hopefully the preacher will get out of the way. Hopefully I'll get out of the way tonight. In such a manner as I am receiving it clear and undiluted. But have you ever noticed how the flesh can get by on bread and water. You don't have to feed the flesh anything and it's ready to go. Have you noticed that? So in order for me to combat that, I need to be continually ingesting the Word of God in as clear a form as possible, in a consistent way as possible. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. And that's why we're here, to feast upon the Word of God and to grow in this time of study. Well, one might ask, and I was kind of thinking this as we were going over the last three weeks. Will somebody please show me what sanctification looks like? I'd like to see it. Where's my model? <laughs> uh, okay, I get it. I want to be sanctified. I want to go there. But who can I look at? What can I look at that I'll go, okay, that's, that's sanctification. Oh, now I see what it's like. Do we have someone? <laughs> the answer is yes. Not only to look at, but to know, to follow, and to believe in. I believe that this was brought up at, at one of the earlier classes. I don't remember which one. But it's John chapter 17, verse 19 where Jesus makes the most remarkable statement, uh, possibly in all the scriptures, once you understand it. He says something that speaks to his deity. He speaks something that nobody else can say. John 17, 19, I sanctify 
myself. Those words could not leave any other lips with any truth in them. Talk about a statement when understood that absolutely stuns, this is it. It is unknown and unexperienced by any other human being, that's for sure. Now, Bible students, you're familiar with John chapter 17, yes? John chapter 17 is that awesome prayer where Jesus is praying to the Father. He's asking that, uh, that he would be glorified again with the glory that he had with him from the beginning. Uh, he's praying for his disciples. Don't take them out of the world. Be with them. Use them in the world. He is in such a close, intimate relationship with the Father. And right in the middle of that, he makes this statement before a sovereign, holy God, the Father, the one who sent him. And Jesus says without hesitation, he says it in a way that it sticks without any contradiction. And he says, I sanctify myself. Let me give you an idea of what Jesus is saying when he says, I sanctify myself. He is saying, within myself is the power, the right, the standing of sanctification. I keep intact my own sanctification. I keep myself apart from sin. I live holy continually. Though on earth, though human, though tempted, my holiness is my own and I keep it. I sanctify myself. Wow! I'm just, is that mind blowing? That in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, New Living Translation, we find out Jesus is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. So awesome and holy is our Lord Jesus Christ. So sinless is the Lord Jesus Christ that as you study his last week there in Jerusalem before the cross, what do we find out? Even his enemies can find nothing wrong with them. I find no fault in the man. I don't know what to do with him. Here you take him. I don't know what to do with them. Here you take him. They don't know what to do with them. He's faultless, absolutely perfect. Acts 3 verse 14. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. Is there, is, there any, is there anybody like Jesus? And the more you know him, the more he just boggles the mind. He, he's so separate from us. He's so... Look, the Bible talks a lot about the attributes of God, right? In fact, we have some of those things memorized, don't we? Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Tzidkenu. We know all those phrases, right? But there's one attribute of God that is repeated three times. What is it? Holy. God is not just holy. God is holy, holy, holy. That's the God you serve. That's the God that you are being called into close commun communion with. That's why it took the sinless blood of Jesus Christ in order that you might have fellowship with that God who is, look, there's a, there are angels right now in heaven at this very moment. Awesome angels, six wings, right now flying through heaven. They are so awestruck at God that all they can say is, holy. That's our God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering of our sin, that we could be made right with God through Christ. 1 Peter 1.19 It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. 2 Peter 2.22 He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. 1 John 3, 5. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins. And there is no sin in him. To be perfectly sanctified means to be separate from sin, to be holy. And there's only one person that fits that bill, and his name is? Jesus. I'm sorry, his name is? Jesus. <laughs> okay, let's go back then. John 17. Let's look. Look at a few verses here for a moment. John 17, 17 through 19. Jesus is praying. Makes you feel like uh, you're walking on holy ground at this particular point. Uh, you know, as you understand John 17, it makes you feel like as you begin to read, I have no business even reading this, you know. That's the kind of feeling that it engenders in me. Jesus praying to the Father right before the cross. He says, sanctify them by your... Oh, that must be a key word then when it comes to sanctification. Finish that for me again. Sanctify them by your... Truth. Your word is... Truth. Wait, I'm beginning to get something here. God wants me to be sanctified, yes? yes. And in order to be sanctified or to grow... I need the word in its purest form. I need it undiluted. I need it consistently. And I need vast quantities of it. And I think to myself, my goodness, this explains it. This is why the New Testament is so vehement against false teachers. This is why Jesus so strongly condemned the religious leaders at the time. Why? They weren't given the truth as it was meant to be given. They were messing with it. And if you, sanctified Christian, grow by truth, and I'm giving you truth that is manipulated, that has holes in it, I, I'm not no longer feeding you to grow. I'm poisoning you. I'm going to get sanctified by the clear ingestion of undiluted word of truth and that only comes from the word of God verse 18 says Jesus says as you father sent me into the world I also have sent them into the world see Jesus mission on earth is not over is it it's not over so who did he leave to do it? Us. Us. And the more I cooperate and the more I continue on in sanctification, the better I'll be able to carry out the mission, ongoing mission of Christ. See how these things fit together? They're like building blocks that must stick together. And he says in verse 19, look, this is love. This is how much Jesus loves us. And for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified, there it is again, by the truth. You look at those verses, and let me ask you, do you think God has a plan for your life? <laughs> do you think he, he is intent on this plan? <laughs> And it, and it requires that you and I then become fully involved, fully motivated about the sanctification process for all our lives. Let's look and see exactly how it was then. Because remember, we're gonna, we're gonna, we got somebody to look at. Well, I want to see what sanctification looked like. I got Jesus. Jesus then ties sanctification together with the Word of God. He also ties sanctification with, right in the middle of this, as you, Father, sent me, so I am going to send them. 
oh, this is kind of cool. So let's see exactly what it means when Jesus said, I sanctified myself. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Then go forward, John 5, 17. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. That shows uh, harmony with the father. They're exactly doing the same thing. John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son, the son also does in like manner. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 7, 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. John chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. And the Father has not left me alone. For, that's a reason word, for, I always do those things that please him. Jesus is the perfect demonstration then of sanctification. Here it is. I do the will of the Father. I do the Father's work in perfect harmony with Him. I do His will exactly. I do what He shows me. I do what pleases Him. I do what glorifies Him. That's perfect sanctification. And you say, well, all those things that Jesus did, did the Father agree? With what Jesus did? Yes. 2 Peter 1.17 For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. Boy, Peter's really waxing eloquent there, isn't he? <laughs> the old fisherman sounds pretty good there, doesn't he? <laughs> Here's what he heard about Jesus. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So let me give you another way to look at sanctification. Perfect sanctification is total obedience to the will of the Father. From the heart, in thought, word, and deed. Okay, so... Here's Jesus with perfect sanctification. Where are we? Jesus is way up here. Perfect. Where are we? <laughs> talk about an arc. <laughs> talk about a curve, huh? A learning curve. We got a long way to go, don't we? Kind of explains why no, nobody, you don't reach a finish line in sanctification. It's that ongoing process until the Lord's done using you here. And then, boom, on to glorification. All right, from here, I want us to move on. If you don't already have it clear, I know you do, that we do not arrive. We are indeed in a lifelong process uh, where we don't cross the finish line, but we're moving along. We're waiting eagerly for glorification when we see Jesus face to face. So, what do God's people look like, then, as they're in the sanctification process? <coughs> are there kind of... Uh, Levels, or is there any kind of a breakdown uh, of this uh, sanctification for us? You know, I mean, Jesus is like, he's there. <laughs> uh, 
the rest of us are being worked on. But uh, this probably, uh, Ginger, was this like two years ago by our house? They started building on the corner there, you know, Warner and uh, Newland. Okay, they started building something on Warner and Newland. And, uh, and I think we had the grandkids with us several times as we drive down Newland. And we were like, we were playing a game. What is that? You know, what's that building going to be? Because it didn't say we're a gas station. And then they did some things like, no, 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 that's not going to be a gas station. And we had all kinds of fun. It's going to be a McDonald's, you know, it's going to be whatever. We were all pretending to guess what this thing was. And they just kept building just a little bit at a time. And then one summer went by, and then another summer went by, no signs, nothing. We were like, oh my gosh, we thought the poor guy was in trouble, you know, it was going to go upside down. Uh, and then, uh, Finally, they put up a sign. It's going to be a car wash, but you couldn't. T you didn't know until that happened. Okay. Each one of us are a construction site, and on this construction site, the Holy Spirit is working on you individually to conform you into the image of Jesus. And for some folks, you, you look at their construction site and you, you can't tell what they are. What is that? <laughs> and others, you see a couple of walls up and you say, oh, I think that's a gas station. <laughs> and for some, it's years go by before you actually begin to see, wait a minute, something is forming. They're learning how to forgive. They're learning how to love. They're learning how to do acts of service. Oh my gosh. In some of the things they've said lately, they sound a little bit like what Jesus might say. That's the sanctification process. We're, we're watching it, each one of us. Now, other construction sites, you look at them and you say, well, what's going on on that side over there? And you see uh, you see the foreman come out, that's the Holy Spirit, and he says, all right, I want you to begin to put all the lumber over here. And, and the person grabs all the lumber and puts it over there. And the Holy Spirit goes, no, 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 you, no, that's not right. I said to put it over here. And you see other people in tug of war with God. Oh, I don't want to look like that, I want to look like this. I don't want to be used by that. I want to be used for this. Have you seen that? Have you lived that? <laughs> Better that we, like Jesus, what did Jesus do? He totally humbled himself, didn't he? If you want to talk about somebody taking a step down, I'll tell you, Christian, we as Christians should never be humiliated because we don't have any concept of what it means to be humiliated. You know what it means to be humiliated? It means to leave the glory of heaven with angels singing, anthems of praise, worship that you could never hear any other place. The beauty of the throne of God. Perfect harmony and perfect obedience and beauty and splendor. And to leave that to be bit upon, to be beaten beyond recognition. That's humiliation. You, do you think we know anything about humbling ourselves? So we f we're following this perfect model of sanctification. And we're construction sites where I know what the Holy Spirit's doing. And now that I know these things, my job then begins to cooperate with them. Where did you want those blocks? I, I, Holy Spirit, I'm moving them over here where you want them. What next, Holy Spirit? You want a driveway here? Awesome, let's do it, Lord. Oh, but it's beyond me. The Holy Spirit says, it's not beyond me. Let's do it. Come on, Paul. And I stop struggling. And I say, I only want to do those things that God wants to do. I only want to say the things that God wants to say. I, I, I'm hoping to come into this place, God. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm so hard-headed. 
where I'm in cooperation with you. Where, where when you say, I say. And where you say, go, I go. And that's, that's, that's sanctification. Oh, Lord Jesus, now I see. Uh, uh, you're, I'm begin Anybody have some scales begin to fall from their eyes on this whole sanctification thing? It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Because the Holy Spirit ordained it with the teaching we've had so far that tonight you're supposed to connect. This is supposed to change you. This is supposed to give you realization of what's happening and why you didn't get raptured the moment you got saved and why you're here tonight. All right, let's take a look at a couple things. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Let's look at some of the saints in progress. Remember when Paul the Apostle got saved and then, you know, uh, he shows up in, uh, he shows up in, uh, uh, where did he show up? In Jerusalem. And he like had all this tremendous enlightenment about, you know, grace and, and how it all works, you know. And, and he was ready to rub shoulders with uh, James and the rest of the boys, you know. And, uh, but you do know they called Paul in the room and they say, Paul, you know, we, we've listened to what you had to say. Yeah, yeah, it sounds about right. But uh, we got you a gift, Paul. And he's like, you did? And they, they say, yeah. Here, it's a, it's a one-way ticket back to Tarshish. <laughs> Your ship leaves in five minutes. <laughs> and there Paul the Apostle went back and it's thought he was a deacon for the next few years. And then by God's providence, you know, Barnabas comes and gets him and say, hey, these, some of these Gentiles are interested in the things of God. What was happening to Paul the Apostle during those years where he's back in Tarshish? I know what I want to do. I know what God's given me. I want to, I want to. He continued on with that. I'm going to save my brother and the Jews. Give me that two by four. The Holy Spirit goes, Gentiles. He goes, Jews. Gentiles. <laughs> and then actually, if you look at Paul the Apostle, he actually in his life, it starts out not so bad until shortly before he dies when he says, what am the chief sinner? <laughs> that total humility, that total comprehension that it's not just words when I say my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. The price was the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Am I my own or am I not? Which is it? <coughs> Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Aren't, aren't babies wonderful? <laughs> you know, there's some, uh, yeah, right, until they spit up. But I mean, have you ever done this thing where you hold a baby and then they just like, they smell good, you know? <laughs> you know, they smell good, you know? And, they, and then you look at them and they don't have any wrinkles, you know? And they're just, they're just so cute, and then they fuss a little, they make the funny little noises, and then you put a bottle in them, you know, and then the parents are always like, oh, look at my little baby, you know, look how cute my baby is, you know, see how sweet my baby is. Well, that, that's great for a baby, but when you're 30 years old, that would not work. <laughs> you don't want to smell a 30-year-old. <laughs> Feed a 30-year-old a bottle, it just doesn't fit, does it? It's like nothing. So when you see a Christian like that, or if that's you, God forbid, then you say, somewhere along the line, I got off at the wrong train station. Maybe I got sucked into some false teaching. Or they said, you know, over at this church, they're doing this thing, I don't know what, and you went to go see it what it was, and you got derailed for a while. And that's it, you got a bad case of arrested spiritual development. And there's a lot of Christians that have arrested spiritual development. They stopped in the, in the sanctification process. And they took a short circuit. Something went off. And what can cause those things? And I'll tell you, it's anything that distracts you. 
Anything that distracts you from eyes on Jesus can mess you up in the sanctification process. Anything that keeps you from his word that does not build up, that does not edify, that does not bless the inner man, all these things, uh, drugs and alcohol, anything that keeps you away from the things of God. And then you say, but it's so hard not to sin. I said, it's so hard not to sin. <laughs> In fact, sometimes it's fun to sin. Ouch. Come on. Ouch. Is it fun to sin? sin? Does the Bible say it's fun to sin? Yes. yes. Sin for a season is fun. Sin for a season. But it's, all, it's always such a short season, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> And the more sanctified you are, the shorter that season gets and the worse you feel about the whole thing. I think we need to start changing our thinking about sin. Let's just suppose that we went to Jesus and we said, Lord Jesus, uh, is it harder on us to sin or not to sin? Which is harder on us? As far as end point goes? Yeah. Sin because you reap what you sow. I think Jesus might tell you and me your new normal is to walk in the Spirit mm -hmm. and not to fulfill the, the desires of your flesh. I think Jesus might tell us when you sin your spirit takes a beating and your fleshly desires take over and anytime your fleshly desires take over it only spirals in one direction and that's down I think I need I think I need a change of heart on this whole idea of sin in my life I'm hurting myself. I'm hurting God's will for me. I'm not cooperating with the foreman of my construction site. Here's another example of those in sanctification broken down into two categories. And Jesus did this. Remember when Jesus was restoring Peter? Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, you know I phileo you. Do you love me? Do you agape me, Peter? Jesus' first answer, he tells Peter, feed my lambs. And if you look up that word lambs, it's speaking of little lambs. It's speaking of just growing. It's speaking of young. It's speaking of immature. So, Jesus at that moment is commissioning Peter to be a teacher of truth of the word to those who are yet immature in their, in their faith and in the sanctification process. Uh, then he says to Peter, tend my sheep. When he uses that word, he uses a different word. He's speaking of those that are fully grown. He's speaking of sheep that are mature. He's speaking of sheep that can go out and graze in the field all by themselves. So you have those who are immature in the sanctification process, and you have those who are mature, but both of them need the teaching of the truth of God's word continually to be fed and to be tended over. Let me give you another. So that's two, two groups there. I got another one. This is three groups. First John. And uh, let me say that since it is the word of truth that sanctifies us, again, uh, let me reiterate, it's our food. We grow off of what we eat. Uh, you only grow from truth. You do not grow from false teaching. Uh, you have to be careful what you let in 
because that is going to feed either your flesh or your spirit. First John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. John, the beloved disciple, writes, I write to you, little children, because you are forgiven for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And then he kind of repeats it again. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, he adds that, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. He actually gives us three categories, because in verse 12, when he begins, little children, their sins are forgiven, he's speaking and using a word that speaks to all children, all of us. It's a general term for children. I will always be the child of my parents, so will you, no matter how old or mature we may become. We're always the children of our parents. But from there he goes on, fathers, young men, little children. First, let me go with the little children. The word that he uses for little children, he refers to those who must have an overseer, must still be nurtured up. They have known the father. This is like all little children have a beginning awareness. They have known the Father. Uh, so this is just salvation. And of course, you know, age doesn't apply here in, in this process. Uh, so this is somebody who just gets saved and has that awesome awareness. I can now cry out, Abba, Father. You know, God's my Father. I remember uh, when I got saved, uh, uh, shortly after I got saved, I'm like within a week or two, I was driving down uh, the road, Imperial Highway, and I came up over, uh, uh, you know, uh, the road went up, <laughs> and uh, there was a beautiful sunset. And I remember looking at that sunset, and I had the immediate reaction, I know who did that. That, that was... Like, within a couple of days of getting saved, I was like, I know who did that. God, my father did that. It was just an awesome experience with my little 68 Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, that is that is what he's talking about when he talks about children. The problem is, as we've already said, some people stay there. They, 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 they get stuck there. I think even some churches are proud to keep their people at this childish level. Uh, they don't know about the patriarchs in the Old Testament. Uh, they don't know Hebrews chapter 11, Hall of Faith. Who are those guys anyway that are listed there? Maybe years before they ever read a song or Lord have mercy, they sit under a pastor who does not teach through the Bible and they don't know not to put up with that. Second is young men. He says to the young men, you've overcome the wicked one. How does that happen? How do we ever overcome the wicked one? That has to be through the word of God abiding in them. These guys have had some study. They've ingested some of the word of God. They know some truth. But notice, they're strong. Sometimes you have to look out for some people with a little bit of knowledge, huh? And know a few doctrinal terms. Boy, they can be dangerous, huh? <laughs> And all of a sudden they know how better to run your ministry than you. <laughs> and then third, I will give you any <laughs> examples of that. Third, the fathers. What we aspire to, and notice what they are characterized by. These are the mature. Because you have known him who is from the beginning. The mature saints have a perspective they have an acceptance of the whole picture, the whole plan as God desires to reveal himself 
through his word. And yet their greatest claim to fame is that they know him. Do you know him personally? Do you walk with the Lord? Listen, that's real maturity right there. Uh, let, me, let me read a couple things here. We're just about to take a break. I got like two minutes up. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Let me read to you, and I want you to listen to this as though what it is, you are listening to it to, uh, spoken by a Christian who has traveled along the sanctification road for a number of years and has cooperated with God. Paul the Apostle writes, in Philippians 3, 8 through 11. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Isn't that awesome? There's a mature brother in Christ walking the road of sanctification. That's what they're going to sound like. That's what it's going to look like in your life. What do most of us look like? Oh man, I had this and then I lost it. I don't have it anymore. God can only give that back to me. Would you pray for me that God will give me my stuff back that he took away? Then I'll be happy. That's all I want in life. <laughs> Isn't that what we sound like? He tells us what? We need to walk the sanctification road a little bit more, don't we? To get to this place where we go, I want Jesus. I want to know all about him. I want to walk with him every day. Whatever he wants from me is nothing. I gladly give up anything to have Christ, to know him more intimately. But we got a ways to go, don't we? Let me close with this. F.B. Meyer. The more I read of F.B. Meyer, the more I like this guy. Here's what he wrote. We may know Christ personally, intimately, face to face. Christ does not live back in the centuries, nor amid the clouds of heaven. He is near us, with us, compassing our path in our lying down and acquainted with all our ways. But we cannot know him in this mortal life except through the illumination and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we can surely know Christ, not a stranger who turns in to visit for the night, or as exalted king of men, there must be an inner knowledge as of those whom he counts his own familiar friends, whom he trusts with his secrets, who eat with him of his own bread, to know Christ in the storm of battle, to know him in the valley of shadow, to know him when the solar light radiates our faces or when they are darkened with disappointments and sorrows, to know the sweetness of his dealing that with the bruised reeds and the smoking flax, to know the tenderness of his sympathy and the strength of his right hand. Father, I thank you, Lord God, uh, for what you have chosen to reveal to us this night uh, in this session on, on sanctification, the goal. And I ask that you would bless these truths to my brothers and sisters, that you'd continue to feed us truth, Lord, and that you'd help us to grow up. Help us to grow up. To be more like our big brother, Jesus. For it is in his precious name we ask these things. And everybody.